right, well, hello, everybody. And it's now for something completely different because I'm not going to be talking about cancer at the cancer meeting. So I'm going to talk to you about some of the genome-wide mosaicisms that we see, my SNP array, and really how to tell the difference between all the different mechanisms that could create some of these patterns. So specifically, the types of whole gene mosaicism that we'll be looking at is mosaic triploidy, where you have an extra haploid set of chromosomes, and chimerism, where you have two cell lines with distinct genomes. So when we're thinking about these, when you have a patient coming in, the things to consider is what is the gender of the patient? And because these involve a full set of different chromosomes, you really want to know what is the sex chromosome complement in all of the cells, because this could have implications for your patient. Also, what's the tissue source? Often, if you only have blood, there could be some types of mosaicism that's limited to the blood. Some phenotypic clues that may suggest that your mosaicism is beyond the blood are things like asymmetry or pigmentation differences, or perhaps some phenotypes associated with uniparental disomy. And some big clues that we often do not get from our clinicians when we get patients is, is there a history of a bone marrow transplant? Is there a history of a dizygotic twin? And the most helpful thing that I have found to uh, sort of distinguish between these types of genome, genomic mosaicisms is looking at the centromeres. So if you go back and review gametogenesis, so when we think of gametogenesis in males, we're going to have a random distribution of centromeres in all the different sperm, especially if they're coming from different original um, uh, primary spermatocytes. We're going to have chromosome 1 and 2 and 3 and 4, when you compare two different sp sperm, the probability of having the same centromeres at each chromosome between two different sperm is 2 to the 23rd, so highly unusual. But when we compare that to female gametogenesis, whatever is in the final ovum, the second polar body will have all of the same centromeres. And the first and second polar bodies from meiosis 1 every centromere will be different. So this is a big clue when we're looking at the patterns of what kind of gametes are involved in our genome-wide mosaicism. So looking at triploidy, so most triploides are going to be two paternal and one maternal, about 85%. Most of the time, this is caused by two sperm or dispermy. However, you can have a meiosis one or two failure, which also um, results in triploidy. Now, mosaic triploidy is actually caused by a delayed incorporation of a third gamete. It is not you're having three gametes and then a rescue of every single chromosome. However, it, it starts out with two gametes fusing, dividing, and then the third gamete fusing to one of those daughter cells. So when we're thinking about this, we can really look for the par parental origin, one by some of the phenotypic clues, but also let's take a look at the centromeres to see what kind of pattern we see across the centromeres. So just to get into mosaic um, for two and three copies, so if we have two copies of a chromosome and now we get three, and we will have three chromosomes where two are identical and one is different, we could also start with three chromosomes for maybe a meiosis two and go down to two chromosomes, but you really just have two chromosomes at different levels, and this is what you probably see in your cancer genomes. Mosaicism with this follows this pattern from normal here to 100% three copies. When we have a third genome or genotype present, such as here, if we had like a meiosis one error with three different chromosomes and you rescue yourself down to two, we see this extra band appearing in our mosaic levels. And this is due to this unique chromosome, in this case, this white chromosome, that's only present in a subset of cells. So this is our model for mosaic um, two to three copies. So here, if we look at the BLO frequency, this would be normal, 0, 0.5, and 1, going to 100% three copies, 0, 1 third, 2 thirds, 1. And this is the pathway that these genotypes take as you get more and more percent of three copies. And in red are those unique genotypes if you have three different chromosomes present. 
So this is some data that I got from Urvashi Surti. We ran um, a mosaic triploidy for her. In the amnio, it was 100% biparental. And in the CVS, it was 100% uh, triploidy. So mixing these two together, we can actually show what a model would look like. Uh, and it goes right along with this theoretical. So here we are at 0%. I'm just showing BLO frequency for four chromosomes. And as we slowly add in that triploid cell at 10, now 20%, we can see these new genotypes are appearing. But they're not appearing everywhere. So this is where this um, is consistent with crossing over and where these extra genotypes are, I have three different chromosomes, and where these extra genotypes are not, I have two of the same chromosome and one different chromosome. So as we go through, you can see how the model fits until we get to 100% triploidy. So now if we just look at those informative genotypes, those extra genotypes, I just picked a random percent, if we look at the centromeres, which are in red, we can see that every single centromere across the genome has the exact same pattern. So this extra genotype is never present at a centromere. That's not possible if we have two random sperm. If we had two random sperm, we would see sometimes I have the same sperm centromere and sometimes I have the different sperm centromere. This is actually consistent with then having one sperm, one egg, and one polar body that was from meiosis II, where my centromeres are always the same. And we used a maternal genome to actually confirm that this was the case of having two maternal contributions. So now when we talk about chimerism, we're getting a little more complicated. We're mixing two people together. So on this side, this is our normal 0.5 and 1 of one individual. And on this side is our 0.5 and 1 of a second individual. Based on how the SNPs are, we either have the same genotype in person 1 and person 2, so AA, and the second person is also AA. So every blue line here represents where the genotypes are the same. All the green lines um, indicate when there's one shared haplotype. So in this case, one child is AA, AA and the other is AB. And in red, these are the most informative genotypes. These are the ones that show us when one child has, is homozygous and the other child is homozygous for the other allele. Now, ooh, going back, the one thing I want to point out is this is symmetric. If you have 20% mosaicism, you can't really tell who is the major and the minor contributor. And there's some percents, like 50%, where it's actually uninformative. Everything lines up. However, if you have an XXXY um, chimera, then there is actually some asymmetry, where this side is the male, so he's only one chromosome, and on this side is the female. So often looking at the sex chromosomes, you can immediately see who's my major and minor contributor. Now if we look at contamination with a random individual, we see all of these different bands. And it looks like this for every chromosome across the entire genome. In this case, we are at about 25%, and we see genotypes that are the same as here or we could be at 75%. I don't know. Okay, so when we do maternal cell contamination, it's actually not as complex because we always share one haplotype with our mother. So those red bands go away, where one's AA and BB, because a child, unless there's some sort of uniparental disomy, should always have at least one shared haplotype. So here's an example around the same percent of maternal cell contamination, where you see this one band is no longer present. So when we're talking about chimerism, what is, is uh, thought of chimerism is tetragametic. So you have two sperm and two eggs. And that's normally thought to be two independent fertilizations that then fuse into one individual. The same kind of pattern can also be seen if you have a sibling-sibling bone marrow transplant or a twin-twin transfusion. And often that's because there's placental vascular connections. So when we look at this, there will be multiple patterns. We'll have parts of the genome where both parents are shared, parts of the genome when only one parent is shared, and parts of the genome where no parents are shared. So we're going to see a mixture of these different patterns. So in here, here is a copy where um, parents are shared, 
This looks like maternal cell contamination, and this looks like true contamination. And when we look at the percents, it's just each of these patterns is consistent with the color coding. The blue, the blue plus the green, the blue plus the green plus the red. So here are two chimeras. One of these is a true chimera, and one of this is a sibling who had a transplant from her sister. And they look pretty much the same. They're about the same percent. But when we take a look at the centromeres, we can see that this individual has all three of those patterns at their centromere, and this individual only has two patterns at their centromere. This one is the result of a, a, a bone marrow transplant from the sibling, so this is truly independent eggs and sperm, where this one is actually more consistent with, because we never see all uh, the same mom and the same dad, this is actually consistent with uh, a polar body from meiosis one being um, fertilized and fusing with the egg with a second sperm. So here's another chimera. This one we only see two patterns, and we see both patterns at the centromere. Now this one can also be the same type of chimera, however the maternal is always the same. We always have the same mom at the centromere, unlike the other one where we always had a different mom at the centromere. Now this could be consistent with a polar body from meiosis too. Okay, so this is another chimera that we have seen. This kid presented with Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome, and we can see a very different pattern here. So this is not what we're seeing here. We don't have any of our 0.5 bands. So this is actually consistent with a normal biparental to uniparental disomy. So I got rid of all the bands that are um, consistent with uh, the 0.5 here. If we look at the centromeres, we have different patterns, and here, because it's asymmetric, we know exactly what percent that we have. And this is consistent with a normal biparental, and having a second sperm due to our random centromere distribution that is a isodisomy. So we have an androgenetic chimera due to genome-wide isodisomy. So this is the same person at various per, like different tissues that are all at different percents. So we can see a high UPD cell line and how the pattern changes as we go to a low UPD cell line. So this almost looks normal and this almost looks like UPD. Here's a case which is actually the most common that we've seen. So if you look at every chromosome, it all looks identical. We don't see the evidence of crossing over. And this just looks like a normal um, copy neutral loss of heterozygosity for the whole genome. In this case, we have an ice, it looks like UPD, and so in order, the only way we can have this kind of pattern is if our isodisomic cell line has the exact same um, of genome that's present in our normal biparental. And so this is some sort of, before the sperm fused with the egg, it uh, went through endoreduplication and formed its own chromosome. And so these patients all presented with Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome, so it's very consistent with this kind of mechanism. So and again, this patient we saw a different um, percents in different tissues, we never saw evidence of crossing over, and it just looked like copy neutral LOH for the entire genome, so at different percents. So when we look at types of whole genome mosaicism, often you can see how many haplotypes are present and how many patterns are present across each chromosome, and how many bands are there, and are there evidence of crossing over. So based on how many haplotypes and if there's crossing over, you can sort of narrow it down to these various types of whole genome mosaicism. So what have we seen at CHOP? So we've done a little over 16,000 postnatal cases. We've seen three cases of blood-limited chimerism, so twin-twin transfusion and bone marrow transplants that no one told me were bone marrow transplants and I got all excited it was a chimera at first. Um, we've seen two cases of real chimer chimerism, one that's true with four different um, genotypes at the centromere, and that one with the two sperm, one egg, and a meiosis two polar body. And what we've seen most, because these patients actually have a severe phenotype, are patients with a UPD cell line. We've had a parthenogenic chimera, or maternal UPD, that presented with Beck with... Um, 
with prader willi like phenotype, and we've seen five cases of the paternal UPD, and they always present with um, very early on with uh, beckwith wiedemann like phenotypes. And we've only seen one case of mosaic triploidy. So the thing that I don't know is what is the true incidence of true chimeris chimerism in controls, and that's maybe something 23andMe or Ancestry can help us with. Yep, I'm done. So <laughs> there's my acknowledgments of our laboratory. So I guess I have no time for questions. No time for questions, yes.